So as we continue our series of kings, prophets, and prostitutes, as we look at this awesome look at the genealogy, it says he was able to take the mess to Messiah, tell us the story of what it looked like through this process. That God loves us so much that he says, I can use our, your mess. I can use your story for my glory. So far we've covered a prophet and two prostitutes and a king. I know if you say it like that, it sounds like a bad joke. But... We begin to see how God was able to use Abraham, to use him in the midst of his mess to have others speak into him. You look at Tamar and that God's used her despite her mess, and in Rahab he was able to use her to build faith in the midst of her mess. So as we look at the King David today, as we look at how he was able to use that, he says when life gets messy, it's important for us to remember that God is not done with us. He doesn't cast us aside or throw us away. That he's still at work. And that same promise that he had for them back then is still true for us today. As we look at our graphic in front of us on the screen, or it's in the pew in front of you, we're going to go a little bit farther on our genealogy. Today we're finally down to King David. Now we've gone through this little passage here. It's been a short route, but we begin to see we go from Solomon and Rahab to Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and to David. Now next week we're going to be focusing in on the bottom portion here, which is the line of Joseph that leads up over towards Jesus, but the line is broken. We'll be focusing on that tomorrow, next Sunday morning, and then next Sunday night we'll finish the actual genealogy through the topper portion of your graphic there through the line of Mary. So you want the full story? Come back for Sunday night. There you go. There's your plug. Okay. But what we begin to see as we look at the story of David, now David means beloved. David means that he was loved, that he was kind of chosen by Jesse. He was kind of the one that was set apart by his family, his brothers. But we begin to see here as he's a son of Jesse, as he rises up. If you know the story of most David's stories revolve around Goliath and battle stories and his heroic nature. I love David. I love telling stories. And this is not one of those heroic battle stories which we get so caught up in. But we still love the story of David here. We see that as he rises up to face Goliath, defeating the Philistines, protecting the identity and the lasting nature of the Israelites here, we see that he is a man's man to the core. Now, guys, don't get jealous here because your wives are going to be like, those are all great qualities because he's a man's man. So we see that he's victorious in battle, right? He loves God. Those are good things. He had a job as a shepherd, right? And in the midst of all that, he can sing songs and praise God. I mean, he's the man's man's full package. Or so, here we begin to see here, but in this midst here, he becomes king. In the midst of all that he is, he's bringing forth this promise of who God has promised to lead them through. Now, that sounds funny to say, but think about it. We go back here a little bit, and the promise is revealed through David, and the promise continues forward throughout that. Now, we begin to see here a second portion of our story here with King David, and we'll focus a little bit later on Bathsheba, but we'll talk about her right now just to give us a glimpse of who she is. So when we get there, we say, yeah, I got it now. So Bathsheba means daughter of oath, a daughter of oath. Now we get a glimpse of Bathsheba, not so much in this story. We get a little bit about her, but you find the true character of her later on written by the son Solomon. Now Solomon was the son between David and Bathsheba, but we begin to see that you actually find out about her in Proverbs 31. Now, Proverbs 31 is key here because we begin to see is that's the chapter we often talk about the godliness nature of women, right? That she was a divine mother, a wife, a woman, protector. We begin to see that all this is say, and said in nature as you describe her as a P31 woman. Now, it's ironic that it was written by her son as wise and as counsel as he was as he sought out provision through Nathan as Nathan was the guidance kind of a leading enforcer and helping him grow and to nurture him along the way that changed the route of all the other brothers in the process here. And so while all, day, all David's other sons used their power to get more power, they misused the ability they had, while Solomon used his wisdom and knowledge to be obedient to God. Now, see so folks, as we begin to see first off, as you see these two characters align, you see the story of David, you see that he's gone through battle, he's in the throne. Now we have to understand the promise that was given. Because we don't know the promise, we don't understand the mess, we don't understand the answer. 
It's, it's pretty much in order here for us. Now, the promise we see is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 13. When he says, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise you up and offspring to succeed you in your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He skip down a couple of verses to verse 16. It says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, what we begin to see in this passage here is David longed to build a house for God. He said, why am I living in this temple, this, this house that I have, when there's no place for the heart? There's no temple for God to dwell in. And so someday, but God says, hold on now, not today, it's not for you to do, but I will lead someone out from you to help build this, to help lead the way for you. So here's the first time we specifically see something different in the line of David Forrest here. Now, if you check this out, you begin to see that right there is the first time God specifically promises the monarch to the line of David. Now, before we begin to see, if Jonathan, if you show that graphic again, the line of Judah, what you have in front of us, so remember the promise was given back to Judah. Now, Judah was not the firstborn in that line right there, but we begin to see that he was the one that was given the promise, the line, the lineage of Jesus. He was given, said, the Lion of Judah that was promised to him that they would come from him, but yet it would not be in a form of king from him, but it would lead to David. Now, this is where it kind of gets interesting because through this process, through the promise that was given to Judah was now relieved and given into David, that he was the answer to that promise from generations before. But now God says, I'm going to give you something for you for the future. It's ironic that it goes from here and it lands here, and you think, well, now is the place and the moment where he would have it all said to him, and he says, no, I'm sending you out forward from you. Now, it's a repeat of what was before. Now, David's response was mature, it was humble, he stayed calm. He wasn't self-focused, but rather he was focused on God. It was easy to focus on today when God told him, no, you're not supposed to do this now, it's not for you, because we don't like no's. For one, and we want it now and today. We want to celebrate and share in what we have today and not in the future. And it says, well, yes, you are the answer to the promise that was before. Your fulfillment will happen in generations later. And yet you might not ever experience that here on earth, but it will be coming from you. Trust me that the promise that you leave will be fulfilled in the future. Now, we begin to see that while he goes to this promise, he goes to accepting this, God responding and allowed David's line to rule for generations upon generations. Eventually, it was removed because of evil. Yet God's promise still stands as he raises up a new branch. A branch that will be able to reign forever. And that's Jesus. Isaiah 11, 1 through 2 says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and an understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He allowed us into the special relationship with God. That, that God may, yes, correct. He, he's going to guide. He's going to instruct. But at the same time, he says, I will not reject Reminding and leaving this mark that says the line of Jesus would la David would last forever in Jesus. Now, David was spectacular in this moment when God graced him with his prophecy. He, he didn't take this approach that while this made me greater, that God would speak to me, that God would use me. But in David's eyes, it made God greater. It's ironic in the nature and the way that he responds, that he shows that it's because of who God is that he would choose David, that he would grace him with that presence leading forward. As you read through Scripture in chapter 7, he responds with this term that's called my servant. He responds with that term, my servant, ten times in that passage. As he reminded him that as David accepted the promise of God, And while he accepted the no to build a temple, a physical temple right there, God says, I'm going to build a house of God through you, through your line. 
So David receives this remarkable promise from God. Remind him that you're not done, that I'm going to use you, that I'm going to leave a line of a legacy that comes from you moving forward. But then we see the mess. And here's the thing that takes place in our lives, because we all can relate to this moment. When you feel like everything's just going great, that you got it all under control, and it's that moment when you feel like everything just broke down. Why did it break down right now and the system's not working anymore? We now find ourselves in that moment where he says, this is that mess. And for David, he was human, and in that moment, he found himself stuck in that mess. In 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 and 2, we begin to see the mess start. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabab. But David rem remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the place of the palace. From the roof, he saw a young woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now, even though he, David was strong in his faith, he had been faithful to God. He's gone through this process. He still had his own messes. And here we begin to see he stays home from battle. And this was unheard of. Most times the king would go to battle with him. He'd lead forward with him. And this time he decides it's important that he stays home. And so it says that he wakes up one night and he's walking upon the roof. The Hebrew verb here for walking suggests that David would be pacing back and forth. He was struggling to sleep. Because we often find ourselves in those moments feeling uneasy when we were not where God has called us to be. That's that churning of the gut, that moment where you just feel sick to your stomach. I know I should have done it. I should have been there. I should have gone. And that's where he says he is, that he can't sleep. He feels sick. And here he is on the rooftop just pacing, knowing he is not where God has called him to be. And so here he is, feeling distant from God, knowing I'm not where I'm supposed to be. But here I am. And this is where he spots Bathsheba bathing. It's interesting because she wasn't acting out in a way that was to be immodest. She wasn't acting out of her normal routine. It must have been the time everyone was sleeping. So she's like, it's a good time to go bathe. She probably didn't think from the rooftop he'd be able to spot me and go through this process. But it doesn't excuse David's side. And what's interesting is for Bathsheba, this was kind of a common practice at the time. For us, we, we have... A story in our family is about my grandma and grandpa. They, they moved into their farmhouse on their wedding day. There's two aunts that were living there. And they moved out, gave them the house and the farm as a wedding gift that they would take over and run it. And this is the same house that Justin and I had fixed up as we were getting ready to get married. And that we were going to move in as well. And we realized that my grandma was telling me this story. And she tells me about a time as she was standing in the kitchen. At that time, the porch was all open and wrapped around the house as it did, and there's no running water in the house except a pump in the kitchen. So here she is in the middle of her day, bathing, and you have that moment when someone's watching, and as she's bathing, she turns and she sees there standing on the porch is the neighbors with welcome to the country gifts. In that moment, she wasn't acting out immodestly, she was doing what she needed to do. Well, in the same way that she was going through her day. And so sometimes we get in this moment where what was she doing? Why would she tempt him like that? She was going through her process. She was going through her day. But we begin to see the problem comes with David. See, in this moment here, David's sin was not seeing Bathsheba. David's sin was to choose to keep his eyes on Bathsheba. He didn't turn away. He didn't flee. He didn't run. And yet in the midst of all that his life has built up, David had numerous wives with numerous kids. In the midst of it, though, it didn't satisfy his lust. What we begin to see is that we can't satisfy lusts of the flesh. That we seek to fill those voids and it says, no matter what you feed it, it's still going to lust. It's going to desire more. And it wasn't so much that he desired Bathsheba as much as he just wasn't satisfied with what God had given him. Her beauty made it a sight tempting to view, but it wasn't in the beauty of the object that we see here. We see that it was in the state of his heart and mind of him being tempted. 
It says, For the nature that it happened that he was pacing on the rooftop, wondering and questioning, God, where am I at and why am I not where I'm supposed to be? It's ironic that it wasn't just a physical placement that he felt like he wasn't where he was supposed to be with God, but also spiritually. It was two-part. He felt distant from God, felt separated and left out. And as David looked at and saw Bathsheba and he saw her beauty, but as he saw what he thought he desired, God said, that, well, that's ugly. See, the problem is, is we desire sin and we have a lustful heart of things of this world and things of this life. The problem is that sin tells and he says, let's rename them so it gives it a good name that you would desire more of and we hide it from the truth of God. Right? When David... As he's viewing out and he sees Bathsheba, he wanted to call it love. God says, I, that's lust. When David looked down and says, I want to call that sexy, God says, that's sin. When David said, I want to call it romantic, God says, that's ruin. When David wanted to call it destiny, God says, that's destruction. See, sometimes we take the symbols of sins and we break them down and we give them new names to change them into positive truths in our lives to reinforce the separation from God. That, that pacing, wandering, that guy that says, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, so I'm just going to rename it so it feels like I'm closer to God. David found himself caught in his own mess as he sought after Bathsheba. But the thing is, as you think about all of this, sin always costs more than what's gained. Sin always costs us more than what's gained. Even though we desire it so much, and it's the desire in the heart it always costs us so much more than what we gain. But in this moment, David seeks to hide his sin as he's been with Bathsheba. He's trying to hide the fact that they've been there. He hides her sin. He's trying to be deceptive. When we begin to see that hidden sin hinders our fellowship with God. No matter what it is. Any sin that we hide and we cower away, that we throw under the rug... Pulls us apart. I met with a guy last year or the year before at CIY. His name is Shan. And he gave me some great advice. And he was talking to me about just taking time to help people bring and restore relationships in life. And he said that so often in life, we try to throw everything under the rug. Right? It's like your children trying to clean the room. And they throw everything either in the closet or underneath their bed. Man, the floors look great. But the other areas are all cluttered up. Sorry, kids, you're in trouble. you got to clean your room today. But we go through this process, and he said, here's the thing about the rug. When we use the term, let's sweep it under the rug, is that there's very few things that actually fit underneath the rug. He says, whenever we say to something to one another, to your spouse, forever, out of hunger or tiredness, you don't mean it. It's not a representation of your relationship. Yeah, let it go. Brush it off. But he says, then there's these big things that really need to be sought for forgiveness, to restore relationships, to rebuild. And we just throw underneath the rug, and we just walk over the rug with this big lump in it and say, yep, that's normal. And here David is in his palace, and he has this rug that just has all these lumps in it, because he just keeps trying to hide stuff underneath it. Because his sin didn't bring the gain that he thought it would. It cost him more than he ever thought it would. So we see that our sin begins to hinder our fellowship with God just the same way as a lumpy rug in our home hinders our ability to be comfortable. What we begin to see is our barrier to our spiritual life. We see that David calls Uriah home in the midst to cover his sin, but yet Uriah refuses to go into his house. He stays out by his pillars outside his home. He says, I refuse to go in as my men are still out fighting the battle. Here David is, he's mad now. He's like, he won't even take the bait. But in that moment, David tried to make everything normal again. It's the human experience. As we sin, we try to make it normal. But 2 Samuel eleven fourteen 14 through 17 says, In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, Put Uriah out in front, for the fighting is fiercest. The withdraw from him so he will be struck, and die, struck down and die. It's not a good sign. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, 
So the men in David's army fell. Moreover, in Uriah the Hittite died. David ignored God's warning here. He failed to escape his own lust. In the midst, he pretty much broke all Ten Commandments. And yet here he is. Here he is in that moment where sin is about to be exposed. He's threatened there. And you think about the story of David. And David, here he is. He has a heart like God. He's the only person in the Bible who's described with a heart like God. And for me, that's a huge honor. I would love someday when God describes me and says, yep, there's Lauren. He has a heart like mine. Because the depth of that definition just continues to go down. There's no ending to that power of what that means upon your life. But yet David, as high as he was, as close as he has walked with his God, as faithful as he's been in the throne that he's upon, we begin to see something take place. Satan didn't come take him out in one swoop. He attacked him and attacked him and attacked him, weakening him through this process, piece by piece. David ends up taking Bathsheba as his wife, and they have that son named Solomon. This is the line of David, the line of Joseph, the one that is corrupt and ruled unworthy. But we begin to see our answer take place here. Well, David had many sons with many wives. This child was to be the one. The one that was going to fill the throne, to have many successors, and to partially fulfill the promise of God. See, Solomon ruled in David's throne. He did. God's mercies never departed from Solomon, though there was sin around him. Solomon built God this magnificent house to dwell in. What we begin to see through this process and through this messy story is that someone else's mess doesn't have to be your mess. See, he could have taken and followed the path of his brothers to seek power, be corrupt. But we begin to see that it leads to all of this. Because as Jesus comes into this world, he was not a product of all the mess that was before him. But he would be the one that would reign forever. We see that as he comes here, he would complete the fulfillment of that promise. See, Jesus reigned and will reign on David's throne forever. We see that the Father's mercy never departed him, even when he became sin for us to be spared. And Jesus is building a, fa- a house for the Father, reclaiming the fact of God's temple and the church is his house. David's dream was to build the temple, to build the place for God to dwell in. And ironically enough, that promise that was given back then that it would soon take place in later generations, he says it comes true in us. That we are the fulfillment, the answer to that promise, that prophecy. That we would be the vessels and the carriers of the Spirit of God. So what does it mean for us? It means that we are to reveal the depth of God's love. We reveal the depth of God's possibilities, the redeeming story and qualities that the proverbial hand of God can lead through generation upon generation upon generation through the mess, through the hard times, the good times, and all those things. And God is able to use all of that to lead us to the Messiah. And it's funny because our God does not stray away from the messy things. But in the midst of our darkness, he says, I'm going to walk right into the middle of that. To right where you are is only I can do to use you to be a vessel, a house for God. See, the thing is, so often we live in that now culture that David had to avoid. As we portray living the dream on social media into this world. But the thing is, behind those false realities we put out there of how great and how perfect every moment is, God enters into the depths of our destruction, to the depths of our darkness. He says, let's be open and honest by our broken situations. Because it says to you and I that none of you are beyond my reach. None of you are farther away 
from me. You don't have to be separated. You don't have to be pacing back and forth. I will restore you to the gospel. And for us, it's all right there in the genealogy of Jesus. From generation to generation. God restoring his people. God leading the way. God answering promises to the most unlikely people. And he says, for you and I, we are the church. That I promised to David that there would be a house for God to dwell in. And God dwells inside of each of us. In the midst of the holiday season, as we share and we focus on the Messiah, it would be a place for others to dwell and to see and to realize that this is our Savior. Who came in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the night, to be a light to our world.